Chris Goodall on a familiar constitutional battle now facing its latest twist and turn. 700 years ago, the Scottish nation, as we know it, came into being right here. In the Declaration of Arbroath of 1320, Scots promised that they would forever reject English domination. It was the start of a very old and often tense relationship, a story of different national wills, wills which are once more diverging, casting the relationship anew. The events of recent years are seemingly endless chaos born in Westminster. Even the events of recent days have continued to add to the sense for many Scots that the Union and all that goes with it is something that cuts against the Scottish grain. In recent months, something striking has happened to public opinion in Scotland. There now appears to be a sustained majority for independence. Seven consecutive polls have now put yes ahead on an average support of around 53% almost inverting the 2014 referendum result. Here we go. A combination of Brexit happening in fact rather than in theory, Boris Johnson's abysmal popularity ratings in Scotland and general approval of how Nicola Sturgeon has performed during Covid seems to have given yes a significant edge. To the UK wide uh, laboratory capacity. There is something going on in and around the coronavirus pandemic where Nicola Sturgeon and the Scottish Government are seen as being very competent um, uh, in contrast to Boris Johnson, the UK government, which is not. You talk about competence. In terms of over COVID, say, I mean, in terms of outcomes, not entirely clear the Scottish government has done any better than what's happened in Westminster. In the matter of public opinion about this, what really matters is public opinion. And the public is right in their assumption. They, they believe that the Scottish government is doing a good job in difficult circumstances. Even if the outcomes are basically the same or more well, or less I'm not, the same I'm as not what, sure the, well, the outcomes... care homes, on excess deaths, you know, it's not it's especially different under decision not to go into lockdown earlier. This is all basically the same as Boris Johnson. Well, no, I, I don't think the public sees it that way uh, here. I think people look at Nicola Sturgeon and say she's doing it well. Boris Johnson isn't. The SNP's ratings after 13 years in government remain nearly hegemonic. The poll suggests that they look set for another thumping victory in next year's Holyrood elections, and should it come, they will claim a mandate to hold another independence referendum. Meanwhile, unionist parties are doing even worse than before. Labour, who used themselves to be the hegemon of Scottish politics, remain adrift. Keir Starmer visited Scotland for the first time as leader today, and whilst his polling isn't bad, that of the party's Scottish leader, Richard Leonard, is poor, and he's struggled to make any impact. He's resisting an internal attempt to force him to resign. Why hasn't Labour made a comeback? Why is Labour still performing so poorly, even several years after you've been leader? People talk about you being non-existent. Well, the Labour Party is in third place. I inherited the Labour Party in third place, and, uh, Still we, in third place. Well, and, and we are striving to make progress. And uh, there were opinion polls at the end of last week, which actually showed us overtaking the Conservatives. So, Still so like, we are, what, so we are, so we are on a trajectory. We are on a trajectory uh, which is forward. Uh, it's a very and, slow and, trajectory. <laughs> well, you know, um, you're going to need to speed up before next May. Well, yes, and that's what I intend to do. And and, and look, I don't underestimate the scale of the political challenge. I was elected by the whole of the membership of the Scottish Labour Party. It's, it's that group of people who gave me a mandate. They are who I am accountable to, and uh, they strongly support my leadership of the Scottish Labour Party. Does Keir Starmer support your leadership of the Scottish yeah, Labour Party? Yeah, I work very well with Keir Starmer, yes. But he said that to you, he wants you to stay on. Yeah, I work very well with Keir Starmer. But Labour have been moribund for half a decade or longer north of the border. It was the Tories who were supposed to be the Scots Unionist champions, revivified under their former leader, Ruth Davidson. But the Scottish Tories have been unable to escape the thrall of what's happening in London. A sense for some that Westminster has discredited itself and its custodians with it. Even this week, the suggestion of breaking international law as part of the UK Internal Market Bill might hardly have been better designed to repel some of the voters who saved the Union six years ago. Back in 2014, there were two groups which, broadly speaking, saved the Union, the old and the middle class. They did so, broadly speaking, for quite similar reasons. One was their entrenched unionism, a unionism which still shouldn't be underestimated, but also because there was a sense at the time that leaving the Union, independence would be risky, volatile, uncertain. But now there is a sense, a sense which some believe is driving support for independence that these people now think that the risky thing, the uncertain thing, the volatile thing, 
is the union itself. The Tories do have a new leader in MP Douglas Ross, but you can hear the frustration not far from the surface. You do accept that the way that Westminster has been perceived, shall we say, over the last five or six years, under a Conservative Party stewardship, has not exactly done much for the union's reputation. Uh, I would accept criticism and, you know, I resigned from government. I had issues with uh, the way this government handled certain aspects uh, and I uh, stood down from government. So I can't stand here and defend everything the UK government have done uh, over the last number of months and years. The Scottish Government uh, and the SNP have been uh, very good at turning the argument back into the Constitution and, and on to their uh, pet topics such as that, rather but that's than your uh, as too well, much focus but that's going your, on but that's, but that's your failure yeah. as well, isn't it? I mean, the fact that Absolutely. despite all of that, despite all of the things that you outline, you can't land the glove on them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, all opposition parties have to take responsibility for you can, of course, look at it another way. Despite the Prime Minister's unpopularity, a Brexit Scotland didn't want, another national government it hasn't voted for. Unionism is still quite strong. It's something that unionists could build on. But then no one on the unionist side seems to quite know how it can be done or who can do it best. The spirit of our growth seems with us again. And I'm joined now by the former Conservative Scottish Secretary, who also served as Foreign Secretary, Sir Malcolm Rifkin, and the SNP's former Europe spokesman, Stephen Gethins. And Sir Malcolm, let's, let's start with you. You've served under various Prime Ministers. Correct. Is Boris Johnson the right person to save the Union? Well, I think it's going to be a challenge uh, for both the SNP and for the Conservative Party, for unionists and nationalists, because we live in a changing times. And I think uh, Johnson has just become prime minister. He's new to the job, relatively speaking. He has great campaigning skills. So we'll have to wait and see. Do you feel relaxed about there being a referendum if the SNP does well next year in the parliamentary election? Well, first of all, the, the, the nationalists have no, no basic justification in demanding another referendum. We did have a referendum. They themselves said this is a once-in-a-generation opportunity. They lost it. And, of course, what they want but to do is... things keep... have changed, haven't well, they? Well, of course things change. Things change every year. So you don't say once Perhaps in a generation... Perhaps not gen... as dramatically as this. No, hold on. Let me answer your first point before you ask me your second one. Uh, so you can't just say because things change each year. Uh, a commitment that it's a once in a generation suddenly uh, disappears. We know that the nationalists would keep wanting referendums until they won one, if they did. And that would be the last referendum we'd ever have on the question of independence. But Brexit hasn't helped the case for the union, no, has it? No, it hasn't. But one fundamental flaw in the nationalist argument on that very point is the nationalists like to say Scotland voted to remain, uh, England uh, nevertheless dragged us out of the European Union. The fact is there were two major parts of the United Kingdom that voted remain and didn't get their way. One was Scotland and the other was London. Uh, almost by exactly the same margins. And therefore, this is not a north-south divide. The fact is the United Kingdom was divided in all sorts of ways, and I'll tell you something else. Although there were some people well, in London at the time saying, sure. let's get independence. Yes, and there was about <laughs> one quarter of, SM, of the people who voted to leave the, e the EU in Scotland who were nationalist supporters. And they were nationalist supporters voting for Brexit you might think paradoxically, but not really. They said, we don't just want independence from London. Why should we want to be dominated by Brussels? So this is all much more complicated than uh, Mrs Sturgeon and the SNP would have you believe. Although it's quite a compelling argument, though, isn't it? If you, in the last referendum, voted to stay in the union because you wanted to stay in the EU, and now the SNP is saying, well, you need to vote to leave the union in order to get back into the EU. That's well, quite compelling. Uh, look, it? if that was the only reason people voted to stay in the United Kingdom, then you, you might be making a fair point. But of course, every person had their own reasons. And the vast majority of people, the 55% who voted uh, to stay in the United Kingdom, uh, did so because they, that was part of their identity. We're often told that the battle for the union is not just about economics, because the SNP know the economic arguments uh, are dead set against their interests. They can't hope to win on economic arguments, so they say it's about identity. Well, identity doesn't just apply to nationalists. You know, I, I and the vast majority of people who are Scots uh, think of themselves as British as well as Scottish. That is part of my identity. Would you expect to vote if there was another referendum? Uh, well, at the moment... Should non-resident Scots uh, vote? Well, there is a powerful argument for that. 
Uh, and uh, I understand that there are practical reasons why it might be complicated, but it's going to be much more of an issue if we have another referendum as to why shouldn't all Scots anywhere in the United Kingdom uh, vote on the future of Scotland in the United Kingdom, because it's their identity as British citizens that will be at stake. And last time, the Labour Party and the Conservatives worked together. It didn't work out that well for Labour in terms of its electoral popularity in Scotland. Can you see Keir Starmer working with Boris Johnson if there is a no campaign well, to be fought? If there was to be another referendum campaign, that's for a decision to be taken then. But, you know, I don't have much in time for the Labour Party. But the, the people who vote Labour and the Labour Party themselves are a unionist party, as are the Liberal Democrats, as are the Conservatives. So if the issue is independence or the union, then all unionists will come together. And it's very significant that uh, the Conservative Party, which is traditionally the main unionist party, is compared to the Labour Party, the dominant unionist force in Scotland. It has more votes now than it had when I was Secretary of State for Scotland. And that says something uh, about the way in which the issue uh, is being determined. Well, let me bring in Stephen Gethins. Stephen Gethins, you know, aren't you over-promising? You know, this will all be easy. You know, you'll get a deal, get back into the EU. But, I mean, we've heard it all before, haven't we? The EU referendum, they promised that it would all be easy and we'd uh, get a deal, no problem. And it's not looking quite so easy at the moment. Well, you're right. They've made an absolute mess of it. An absolute mess of it. And, you know, leaving the European Union was always going to make us poorer and worse off. And in particular, it was going to make us poorer and worse off the harder Brexit that you've got. And we're going to get the hardest of hard Brexits. And that's no good for anybody. And we know that we'll be worse off and it'll be economically catastrophic because the UK government's own figures tell us that. And if your neighbour's making a really bad mistake, and economists and others agree this is a bad mistake, why would you maintain that mistake? I mean, Scotland, if, 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 if you look elsewhere, if you look at Ireland, if you look at Denmark, if you look at the other independent and sovereign states that, who are members of the European Union, they want to be members of the European Union and are doing much better. And if you compare that to an increasingly isolated United Kingdom, that's been cut adrift from its partners, I'm not sure how attractive that is, and that's why you're seeing the change in polls. And yes, you, you mentioned that change in polls. Lewis, Lewis talked about that in his piece. But despite everything, you know, you've got a Prime Minister of the UK who's incredibly unpopular in Scotland amongst many people. You've got Brexit happening. You've got the umpteenth government yep. that you didn't vote for in Scotland. And yet, support for the union is still looking like it's on sort of 45, 50 per cent. Doesn't that actually speak to the strength of the union? Your lead isn't as decisive as it should be, even in the most difficult of times for a unionist, I suppose. Well, look, I think the first thing you're right, support for the union is a minority pursuit. And if it's a minority pursuit, then let's do something about it. But the only way you can really tell, the only way you can make a decision is by having a vote so that people can make their own minds up about their future. This isn't just about something that's pretty basic. You know, we're losing our European citizenship. We're taking away rights and opportunities from young people that I enjoyed when I was growing up in education and jobs and freedom of movement and elsewhere. And people should have a choice in that. And I think it's really striking that you see younger people in particular where independence is particularly strong because they've got that similar internationalist vision where you want to work with your partners on an equal footing and the european union is is the future as our as our neighbors and partners see it elsewhere not this isolationism and backwardness of um, a hard brexit with boris johnson so if we get to a situation where westminster refuses your referendum you get a majority next year do you think you should go ahead with a referendum anyway well, I think we should have a, a, a referendum. It was, um, it's something I think that, that should at long last. The Tories have to recognise the democratic right of the people of Scotland to decide their own future. The people who live and, 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 and work here, the people who have committed to, to living here, just as in other European states as well. So, yes, I think we should have that referendum. I, I think now's the time. And the deeper you get into Brexit and the further away you get from European Union membership, the more damaging it is. So I think the sooner we can do that, the better. Stephen Gethins and Malcolm Rifkin, thank you so much.